Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this ICTD lecture on uh, property taxation. I'm Colette Nyarakamana and I'm the program lead for uh, the African Property Tax Initiative. Dr. Wilson Pritchard and I uh, will give you uh, today an overview of um, the key issues related to property taxation, as well as the strategies to unlock uh, the property tax potential. So we are delighted to have you uh, here and we hope you will enjoy uh, this uh, seminar. I would like to start uh, by providing a summary of the importance of property taxes. Uh, as we know around the world, uh, property taxes are the bedrock of, pro uh, of uh, local revenue mobilization. But in low income countries, property taxes are severely under collected. And this poor performance reflects technical challenges, administrative challenges, but also major political barriers and a broken social contract with taxpayers. So unlocking successful reform demands more appropriate technical approaches, strategies to improve administrative performance, and strategies to overcome political resistance, including more effective engagement with and responsiveness to taxpayers. So uh, this lecture uh, will be divided into three uh, sections. I will start uh, by giving you an overview of the significance of property taxes in the first section. Then Will will join us in the sec second section to present the property tax cycle with an emphasis on the key issues for each cycle, as well as the key questions and key approaches to address these issues. I will then rejoin you in the third section to give you an overview of the strategies to unlock a successful reform, mainly by underlining uh, institutional as well as uh, varieties of uh, administrative and uh, political challenges to be considered in, in, uh, in unlocking this potential. Following that, uh, Will will rejoin us uh, to present uh, how property tax reform can be better aligned to the capacity, administrative and political constraints of low income countries. Uh, in this first uh, section, I would like to start with uh, a simple question, why property taxes? Uh, five key elements can allow us to understand the importance of property taxes. First, a more attention should be paid on property taxes in a context of rapid urbanization and urgent funding needs. Secondly, uh, property taxes represent a large but unrealized revenue potential. Third, uh, property taxes can improve equity of subnational revenue collection. Fourth, uh, property taxes are economically efficient. And lastly, property taxes have the potential to strengthen the social contract. So for the first point, uh, property taxes should be harnessed in a context of rapid urbanization and urgent funding needs. In fact, uh, in African and other low income uh, countries are urbanizing more rapidly than anywhere else in the world. And in Africa, uh, the population, uh, the total population projected uh, is projected to double uh, between 2010 and 2040 to nearly 2 billion, according to a UN Habitat report. And about 430 million will live in urban centers. So rapid urbanization, rapid urban growth, and rapid urban population uh, growth as well are generating enormous demands for new infrastructure and service delivery. And uh, such as mainly the access to better roads to facilitate mobility, or uh, even the access to basic uh, services such as garbage collection and sanitation. Yet uh, the revenue available to cities and other uh, subnational governments are often hugely inadequate to the task. In fact, uh, in many cases, many cities, the revenue mobilized by uh, cities and other local governments is often low and local governments will rely or depend on central government transfers or donor uh, grants to finance public service delivery. So while intergovernmental fiscal transfers 
can be a constant source of uh, revenues, they are often insufficient to support economic development in growing urban centers. They can also limit uh, the autonomy of local governments to set priorities and undertake long-term development projects, or even fund uh, adequate services when needs are enormous. On the second point, uh, property taxes uh, represent a large but unrealized revenue potential. Uh, around the world, uh, property taxes are the backbone of local government own revenues and finances. And property taxes should be easy to collect as property is visible and immovable, which makes uh, it easy to target. And collection should increase over time with property values, with the assumption that the tax rate uh, is proportional to the value of the property and that as a property increases in value, so is the tax rate for this property. Yet, uh, this is not frequently uh, the case. Uh, um, also, uh, in some OECD countries, property tax revenues amount to as much as 3% uh, of GDP, whereas in more, uh, more uh, low-income countries, uh, collection languishes at 0.2% of GDP or even lower than that. Uh, just to give you an example contrasting this uh, performance, uh, in Canada, uh, property taxes make up about 38% of municipal finance revenues. In the USA, uh, it is estimated that property taxes account for nearly uh, three quarters of local tax collections. On the other hand, in Uganda, property taxes are estimated to account to uh, only 3% uh, of all revenues for local governments. While in Ghana, the rate is a little bit higher, or the percentage is a little bit higher, and property taxes uh, make up about 14% uh, of uh, local uh, government revenues. Oh, so this uh, unrealized potential is driven mainly by weak collection from high value properties, which should provide the bulk of revenue potential. A good example to illustrate that is uh, the case of uh, the reform in Freetown that show uh, that uh, the top 20% of property provides a 70% of revenue potential, assuming that tax compliance is high. So in other words, the 20% of property owners are supposed or are estimated to provide 70% of the total property tax revenue. Uh, finally, uh, this unrealized potential reflects a weak uh, policy, mainly uh, setting a low rates or even extensive uh, exemptions. So on top of that, there are also major uh, challenges of administration, including the lack of capacity to capture the property tax uh, in the property tax registry in new properties issues related to undervaluation, and also low to even non-tax compliance in some cases. On the third point, uh, property taxes are um, economically efficient. In fact, uh, this tax is often called a good tax because uh, it does not distort uh, productive uh, decisions about work or investment. In other words, property taxes do not discourage work or investment. While uh, taxes and fees on businesses can discourage economic activities, assuming that the tax rate is high and may be uh, discouraging for uh, individuals uh, who wish to start a business activity, property taxes can be easily taxed without leading to economic distortion. And when uh, new public investments increase property value, uh, part of the revenue gained uh, recovered, the, re the gain that is recovered in tax can be used to support new public investment. As illustrated in the image uh, in this slide, uh, we can see that, uh, uh, or the illustration shows that if the revenue mobilized is reinvested in public infrastructure, such as road improvements, property taxes tend to increase the value of the property. On the third point, uh, property taxes have the potential to improve equity of subnational revenue. Um, subnational tax systems are known to be uh, often highly regressive, especially in low-income countries. 
with heavy reliance on flat rate levies and levies on low income groups. A good example is the collection of uh, daily market fees in many African cities or low income uh, countries as well, which can represent an excessively high tax burden on low income individuals who are mainly women. At the same time, a collecting market fees can extremely be efficient knowing that uh, the tax, uh, the fee or the tax rate is low. And in many cases, uh, the cost of collection may be higher than the revenue uh, collected or the revenue that are supposed to be gained. So in this situation, a property tax uh, offers the potential to be relatively progressive and progress uh, property owners, uh, considering that property ownership is dominated by those who are better off and more valuable uh, properties pay more. Uh, it is important here to note that equity is not always guaranteed. Uh, in other words, having a progressive uh, tax system depends also on policy, effective evaluation, uh, and fair administration as well as equity. And progressivity needs to consider the case of uh, property rich income poor households who are mainly individuals, either employees, self-employees or people on retirement who may own uh, uh, high value properties but do not have enough income to be able to afford or to pay their tax liability, which often are proportional to uh, the value of their properties. So all these factors need to be considered when thinking about equity and progressivity of a property tax system. On the fourth point, uh, property taxes have the potential to strengthen the social contract. Understanding the relationship between property taxes and the social contract requires situating uh, this relationship in the broader context of uh, decentralization uh, reforms. Uh, these reforms that were implemented mainly in the 90s uh, promised to bring together uh, or, or bring closer uh, local governments closer to citizens in order to increase responsiveness to citizen preferences and also uh, local accountability. So bringing together local governments and citizens imply that local authorities are better positioned to the need to understand the needs of citizens. And in return, uh, citizens are expected to fulfill their uh, civic duties by paying their taxes. However, uh, the social contract uh, that has been, has, uh, been held back uh, in part uh, by the weakness of subnational taxation, creating what is often referred to as a vicious cycle. This implies that limited fiscal autonomy re re reduces responsiveness to local preferences, as if local governments do not have enough revenue, they will not be able to fund services corresponding to local preferences. And when inadequate uh, services are not provided, citizens will be less encouraged to pay taxes. So limited taxation then will reduce incentives for accountability by uh, local uh, authorities or local leaders, as well as citizen uh, this demand making. So in this uh, context, property taxes are ideally suited to strengthening accountability a build, and building a virtuous cycle of improved outcome. As you can see in the chart, this virtuous vis uh, cycle implies that um, expanded taxation uh, is likely to lead to um, more outreach and engagement by local authorities with citizens and more engagement will allow local authorities to identify or understand the citizens, the needs, the, city, the needs of citizens. And this understanding will allow them to uh, provide effective uh, or better services adapted to the needs of citizens. If service provision is effective and um, adapted to the needs of citizens, this will increase citizens' trust and in turn, trust will increase tax compliance, which will then lead to expanded taxation. So this can be possible because uh, property taxes are highly visible to taxpayers and revenues are straightforward to link directly to specific service delivery as well as public goods. As again, it is assumed that 
the revenue collected is reinvested in public services for the community. Uh, now, uh, think about service delivery um, or what um, property taxes should pay for or what kind of services should property taxes be used for. Uh, in, uh, calls or requires to understand a rather long de uh, standing debate about whether uh, property taxes should be used or should be understood as a wealth tax which is to support uh, broader services, governance and redistribution, or if property taxes should be understood as a benefit tax, implying payment for uh, public services enjoyed by properties. Uh, this debate uh, can and has become, or mostly is, can become a barrier uh, to action amid arguments over what benefits are provided and how they should be valued. So in practice, uh, property taxes are best understood uh, as encompassing um, both wealth tax and benefit tax elements. And linked uh, to property tax value, potentially taking a special uh, account of access to services with uh, progressive rates and understanding the benefits provided by the government broadly. And also with benefits, in turn, be defined broadly to reflect all aspects of city governance or local government governance that underpin the value of different properties. Having understood the potential and importance of property taxes across the world in raising more revenue, improving equity, and strengthening accountability, but also the severe underperformance of those taxes in practice in most low and also middle income countries. The central question for reformers is how property tax systems can be reformed in order to perform much more successfully in raising more revenue, ensuring that that revenue is raised equitably, and empowering taxpayers to trust that system encouraging them to comply and giving them a voice in shaping how revenues are used in practice to benefit taxpayers and the broader population within local jurisdictions. And in order to understand that question, it's useful to begin from understanding the way in which property taxes function in practice by understanding the different stages of an effective property tax cycle, we can then reflect on where particular property tax systems may be falling short of their ambitions and the kinds of reform options that may help to improve outcomes. With that in mind, we can begin by thinking of property taxation as a cycle, that is, as a series of steps that's repeated year after year in order to ensure that the system remains up to date and effective in raising revenue equitably and accountably from taxpayers. And while one can reasonably divide the property tax cycle into different kinds of stages, I'm personally a fan of dividing into the six stages described here. First, identifying all properties that should be taxed. Second, assigning a taxable value to those properties on which taxes will be levied. Third, setting tax rates and then billing taxpayers their tax due based on that rate and their property value. Third, sensitizing the population to the details of the system, what they're expected to pay, why they're expected to pay, and also what they get in return for those payments. Fifth, is creating a system to facilitate payment by taxpayers and effective collection of property tax revenues. And then finally, compliance and enforcement actions against those taxpayers who do not pay voluntarily in order to ensure that all taxpayers are paying their fair share of the tax burden. So what follows, I'd like to walk through each section of that tax cycle, walking through what the central issues are, what some key questions are for policymakers and administrators, and in turn, some of the dominant technical approaches to approaching those challenges. The goal isn't to be entirely comprehensive, but rather to capture the key conceptual issues 
around which specific strategies can be built in specific contexts. The first stage in any effort to strengthen property taxation, of course, lies in identifying all properties within a jurisdiction that should be eligible to pay taxes. Yet while this seems like a relatively simple and straightforward task, in practice, property lists, often referred to as property registers, are notoriously and often severely incomplete in low and middle income countries meaning that some countries are captured in the property tax register and are being asked to pay taxes, while other properties are completely unregistered and are not being asked to pay taxes, creating severe inequities, but also undermining revenue collection. The incompleteness of property registers can arrive for several kinds of reasons. One is simply errors in efforts to build maps of properties within a particular jurisdiction. Something that's particularly likely, particularly in manual systems, where certain properties may simply be missed. A second possible explanation is that the properties are missed somewhat more intentionally. That is collusion between government administrators and property taxpayers mean that those properties are intentionally left out of property registers in order to avoid them being taxed. A third possibility is that property registers may simply become out of date over time. That is, at one point in time, there's a complete property register in place, but as new properties are built, they fail to be added to the property tax register, such that earlier properties are paying taxes, but newer properties are not. Finally, there may be additional administrative reasons which prevent properties from being effectively registered for tax purposes. One of those reasons relates to a central question for those thinking about property identification which is the relationship between the construction of formal cadastres, that is formal registers of legal ownership of property, and the construction of property registers, that is lists of properties that are eligible to be taxed by the government. Historically, it was common to begin from a formal cadaster before then moving to tax a property. That is, the first task is to identify a property, then to formally register that property often at a ministry of lands or land agency, and establish its formal legal ownership. And only after that property has been registered and legal ownership has been established, will that property then be eligible to be taxed. But while that has a procedural elegance to it, in practice it has proven hugely problematic across low and middle income countries. And that's because particularly in low income countries, although of course to varying degrees, the formal registration of properties and their ownership can be slow, administratively difficult, costly, and often contentious amidst competition for property ownership or debates over property ownership. Cadaster is a slow process that can prevent properties from being in, brought into the tax register. But where properties are not brought into the tax register, that undermines revenue potential, and perhaps more importantly, creates deep inequities within the property tax system because some properties are paying and others are not. Moreover, if property owners know that registering your property formally will then make you eligible to pay taxes, that actually often creates a strong disincentive to registering a property for tax purposes because not being registered allows you also to avoid effective taxation. As a result, a growing number of researchers and practitioners have sought to reverse the order of these functions. Instead of beginning from a formal cadaster, which leads towards taxation, registering properties for taxation, a much simpler task, which only requires identifying the property itself and delivering a bill to it, and then having identified properties for tax purposes, then trying to use that as a foundation to engage with property owners and register those properties more formally and to register their ownership. While that strategy is not without its challenges, it appears to be a more pragmatic, more effective, more efficient process for moving the strengthening of property taxation forward in many contexts. Putting aside the question of the relationship between formal cadastres and property identification for tax purposes, the other central question about property identification 
is how, in fact, to map those properties and bring them into the property register. And there are different kinds of strategies that may be deployed. Historically, most governments have relied on a manual process of sending government officials or enumerators to the field to manually identify properties and place them in the property tax register. More common now more recently has been reliance on satellite imagery to manually or automatically map properties within a geographic area. In other places, governments have also begun to rely on more sophisticated technologies like the use of drones, for example, to map properties within a given jurisdiction. Focusing on the most common modern method of doing this, which is reliance on satellite imagery, there's often a combination of reliance on satellite imagery, but then also ground truthing that information through visits by government officials or enumerators. The broad process often involves first, getting a satellite map of a jurisdiction, second, potentially relying on an automatic algorithm to identify individual properties on that map, or alternatively, using a manual process to identify individual properties on that map. And then subsequent to that, sending physical enumerators to the field to verify that that information is accurate in practice. This is particularly important often in urban areas where it may be necessary to distinguish between different properties which are tightly clustered together and may be difficult to distinguish from satellite imagery. But the central advantage of using satellite imagery or something similar for this purpose is that it's easily verifiable after the fact as you can easily see gaps. It can easily be updated as those maps change and it provides a relatively quick and cost-effective means for bringing properties into the property register, particularly in larger areas. And this image here just gives you an illustration of what this looks like. On the left, you can see an initial satellite imagery uh, from an urban area. And then on the right, you can see an automatic algorithm, which are increasingly widely available, which then identifies each individual property within the city. And what we tend to find is that those automatic algorithms are fairly accurate at distinguishing individual properties, but they do make errors. And so that ground truthing process can be important to ensure accuracy and completeness. Once properties have been identified, we arrive at what is often the most contentious and complex aspect of building effective property registers in low-income countries in particular, which is the question of valuation because the taxes that any property will need to pay depend on the taxable value that's assigned, assigned to that property. A higher taxable value results in paying more taxes, a lower taxable value results in paying less. And so assigning accurate values is critical both to revenue potential and to equity. Where inadequate values are assigned to the most valuable properties in particular, that undermines the potential to raise significant amounts of revenue because the lion's share of revenue should come from those high value properties. Equally, when high value properties have valuations assigned that are too low or where lower value properties are assigned valuations that are too high, that can create serious problems of equity within the system where those who are owners of large, relatively luxurious properties are paying the same amount as those in smaller, much lower quality properties. Whereas what we'd like to see is higher value, larger properties paying substantially more and lower value, smaller properties paying substantially less. There are a whole host of reasons why valuation roles in practice in many low-income countries are highly ineffective. And in particular, we tend to see severe undervaluation of high value properties, but also significant inequities in the valuation of different kinds of properties. And this arises again for a number of different reasons. One can be the simple technical complexity of valuing properties in the context of property markets that are often very opaque and where getting detailed information about property values can be difficult. In those contexts, valuation can be highly subjective and obviously prone to some areas, errors. A second reason this might happen is because of collusion and corruption. You might find that property valuers are colluding with taxpayers to provide a lower valuation for their property in exchange for some kind of payment to them. Right? This can be beneficial to the property owner and the administrator, but undermine revenue potential. 
A third reason is a failure to update valuations over time. It might be that you have a highly effective valuation system at a particular point in time. But over time, if those valuations aren't updated, that valuation is going to fall out of line with the market, particularly where property values in a given market are rising, which has been the case in much of the low-income world in recent decades. Properties that were valued earlier will end up being severely undervalued after a period of years or decades, again, creating enormous inequity in the system, but also severely undermining revenue potential. And so the central question for administrators is how to build a valuation system that will reliably assign and update values to properties, that will ensure equity between more and less valuable properties, and that's also transparent enough to reduce risks of collusion and corruption in the assigning of values to properties. Historically, there have been three dominant models for valuing properties. The first is what's known as expert market or rental-based value estimation. In these models, an expert property valuer who is certified as a property valuer may be sent out to the field to visit individual properties, to observe the external characteristics of those properties, the internal characteristics of those properties and their broader location, and on the basis of that information, to assign a valuation to the property. As they do that, they'll do their best to make reference to market data and market information, though again, that information is often very scarce in the context of low-income countries and particularly outside of capital cities. An alternative approach is to rely on what's called area-based systems. Within area-based systems, there's an emphasis on simplicity. And the goal of the administration is simply to measure the size of all properties and to assign a value to those, a taxable value to, value to those properties based solely on the size of those properties or perhaps also based on their location, but without reference to any broader characteristics of those properties. Such a valuation is much simpler and much more transparent, but it creates problems of equity because properties that are the same size but may vary dramatically in quality are nonetheless assigned the same taxable value. And so these two methodologies each present significant challenges. Expert market or rental value estimation is in theory highly accurate, but in practice it may not be that accurate where that market value information is hard to come by because those valuations can become highly subjective and are also vulnerable to collusion with taxpayers. But even aside from those concerns, expert market value estimation is also hugely costly, complex, and potentially slow because it relies on deploying individual experts, relatively high paid, to every single property in the city to engage in an in-depth evaluation of that property. And one of the consequences is that it can become very slow to bring new properties into property registers. It can also be slow to update valuations over time, leading to inequity and undermining revenue potential. Area-based systems are more attractive in that they're simpler and easier to update over time, the trouble is they're highly inequitable because they don't distinguish different kinds of properties, only their size. Given those challenges, more recent initiatives have often relied on what are known as hybrid models. And hybrid models, in effect, try to find a sweet spot between the purported accuracy of expert valuation and the transparency and simplicity of area-based approaches. Often they do that by trying to identify a smaller group of property characteristics that are particularly critical to shaping value, but are also particularly easy to observe and collect, and then trying to translate those property characteristics into values of properties using some kind of a simpler formula or methodology. That makes the system simpler to administer, but also more transparent because one can observe the particular property characteristics and the standard methodology or formula for generating property values. It's worth saying that a fourth option also exists in some countries, which is relying on self-assessment. That is, taxpayers will report to the government the value of their own properties for tax purposes. The problem is that while this appears to sidestep the need to send valuers to every property, in fact, it doesn't entirely do that. 
Because in order for a self-assessment system to work effectively, the government needs to be able to verify the valuations that are submitted by taxpayers. And that means they need to have the same capacity to go out to the field and establish property values in practice. By way of illustration, I wanna speak for a minute about what one of these hybrid models of valuation, often referred to as the points-based model, and one which has been a frequent subject of ICTD research. And like hybrid models in general, the goal of a points-based model is to identify key characteristics of properties. In general, the size of the property, the location of the property, and a set of easily observable external characteristics to collect all of that data systematically for all properties in a jurisdiction, and then to develop a simple model for translating those property characteristics into an estimated taxable value of that property. More specifically, this methodology often begins from using satellite images to identify, locate, and measure the size of different properties. Enumerators are then sent to the field to collect data on externally observable characteristics of the property. Focus on only on externally observable characteristics because they're easier to collect and to verify. And then in parallel to that process, governments or external partners may rely on expert valuers to go and establish market values for a subset sample of properties within that jurisdiction, perhaps hundreds or perhaps thousands, depending on the size of the jurisdiction. And they can then use those expert values for a sample of properties in the city to build a model that tries to estimate the value, the taxable value of properties from their location, their size, and their key externally observable property characteristics. Right? And the goal is to come up with a formula which when applied to the data that's been collected generates estimated valuations that are as close as possible to the expert valuations that have been collected for that sample of properties. And the logic of that model is reflected in the bottom right here with this line of best fit. You can think of that red line as reflecting the estimated values that are generated by the model and the black dots as the actual values estimated by expert valuers. The closer that red line is to the black dots, the more this simplified methodology is achieving the same outcome we would have gotten, but at much greater cost using expert valuers across the city. And the attraction of this methodology, again, is that it's simple, it's quick, and it's highly transparent because everyone can verify the recorded characteristics of their properties and see transparently how those characteristics are translated into taxable values. And here is an illustration of what broadly that might look like in practice. You have a picture of the property, you have the location of the property, you have the size of the property, and then on the right side here, you can see each of the characteristics of the property that have been recorded by enumerators and the impact of each of those characteristics on the taxable value of the property. If you have higher quality walls, your taxable value is 21% higher. If you have a high quality fence, the taxable value of the property is 20%, 21% higher. If you're in a high value location in this particular location, your taxable value is 37% higher and so on. And every taxpayer can have access to that information to verify its accuracy and to understand the basis for their assessment. Having assessed the value of the property using one of the methodologies that I've described so far, Governments then turn to the task of setting property tax rates, that is the rate of taxation that will be applied to the value to arrive at the total tax payable for any given, uh, for any given taxpayer. And in principle, this should be a relatively straightforward process. You can establish how much revenue you'd like to raise. You can also establish the ability to pay of your taxpayers and then try to find a rate that best balances the revenue you'd like to collect to pay for services and the ability to pay of taxpayers. The primary challenge that we see in practice across many countries is the existence of widespread tax exemptions that then become difficult to administer and erode the tax base quite significantly. And in, in isolation, those exemptions might seem sensible. In some places, you see exemptions for primary residents, 
to avoid tax burdens on families that may have a limited ability to pay. You might have exemptions for charitable organizations or religious organizations or exemptions for government buildings. But the trouble of those exemptions is twofold. One is if they're too broad, they can dramatically undermine revenue potential and also the broader equity of the system. That's often true, for example, of exemptions for primary residences. The bigger concern, though, in many ways, is that tax exemptions can be very difficult to administer. Once taxpayers understand that an exemption exists, they will have an incentive to try to make it appear that they're eligible for that exemption in order to escape taxation. And governments often face serious challenges in verifying eligibility over time. And so you often find that many properties that should be paying taxes are not paying in practice because they've found loopholes within the administrative system. The key question then for governments is what is the right balance between introducing tax exemptions and special treatments to protect equity in particular, and the need to ensure simplicity of the system and minimize exemptions in order to ensure that the system is easy to administer. This is often most important in relation to thinking about taxing the properties of lower income households. Particularly important is often the case of families that may have very little income, but have relatively significant and valuable properties. Something that's not uncommon in urban areas in lower income countries, where families may have long standing family compounds or family properties around which cities have grown, such that the value of that property is now very high, even if the family itself has limited income. And governments often want to find a way to introduce those households to the tax system, but not to tax them so heavily that they can't afford to pay. And that's a particularly important policy decision that many governments face as they introduce more effective systems. But in broad terms, while there's no simple answer to that specific question, the general message to policymakers is to try to adopt simple rules and where you identify exemptions, if you do at all, to ensure that they're tightly defined with clear criteria and are effectively enforced to ensure that only those who are truly eligible are benefiting and to maintain equity within the system. Having a set rates, the next stage in administering property tax systems is the billing of properties. That is the distribution of tax bills to all properties in order to then inform them of their tax liability and get them to pay their taxes. The issues that we observe very frequently in lower income contexts are twofold. The first is that the distribution of tax bills is often very incomplete. That is, many properties don't receive a bill at all and therefore either don't need to pay or don't believe that they need to pay or don't believe that the government's demand for payment is really credible. The second is that bills may be delivered, but those deliveries aren't well tracked. And so governments may not know who's received a bill and who hasn't. And if you don't know who's received a bill and who hasn't, it can then be difficult or impossible to pursue taxpayers if they haven't complied by the payment deadline. And so the central question for governments is how to ensure that all taxpayers receive a tax bill in some form, and also that governments know which tax bills have been delivered to whom. And there are three kinds of broad strategies for doing this. The most common is, as I've described it so far, to rely on building a team of delivery people to deliver bills to every single household. That can be assisted by technology, that's the image on the right here, which may map all properties for those delivery people in order to guide them to the right properties, ensure delivery of the bill, and actually verify that bills have been delivered. It can also, of course, be done using manual systems that serve the same purpose. A second alternative, though quite uncommon, is to make bills available for collection at government offices or online, such that responsibility now lies with the taxpayer to go and get their bill. This is particularly possible if you make bills available online, though it then raises questions about whether you make those bills publicly accessible, or if not, how you ensure that people can access online systems to access their property tax bills. But in the long term, that kind of a system can potentially reduce costs of collection and the complex or of delivery and the complexity of doing so.
A third option in many places is reliance on self-assessment, as I've described before, where rather than valuing a property and delivering a bill to taxpayers, it's the responsibility of taxpayers to submit a tax return to government, identifying the value of the property and making payment. But again, those systems really do still rely on the government's ability to verify all of those steps. All of these processes in principle are intuitively and conceptually quite straightforward, but they're also administratively relatively complex operations requiring large numbers of people to be engaged in making deliveries in complex urban environments. And in that context, there's a need to build up adequate administrative capacity to manage that process successfully, often in partnership potentially with private sector firms or others involved in postal delivery in different jurisdictions. Once bills have been delivered, the next tax for governments is to try to persuade taxpayers to pay their taxes voluntarily. And we know that citizens are more likely to comply with taxes and to support reform efforts more generally if they understand why they're being asked to pay, how to pay, and in turn what they get in return for their payments. But we also know that in most jurisdictions, taxpayers actually lack much of that information. That is, they don't understand the basis for their valuation and for the tax bill that they're receiving. They often have limited information about how to pay or at least how to appeal payments if they're not comfortable with their valuation. And they often know very little about what they're getting in return and have very little voice in trying to shape how property tax revenues are used. And so the key question for governments is if they want to encourage more voluntary compliance by taxpayers, what are the most effective strategies for sharing meaningful information with taxpayers about why they're being asked to pay, how to pay, and what they get in return in ways that are going to encourage compliance and broader political support for effective taxation? And again, there's no single answer to that question because the information that citizens want may vary across different jurisdictions, as may the best mechanisms for rate reaching taxpayers with that information. But there are some broad messages that seem quite common. One is the importance of communicating fairness and reciprocity. That is, that everyone is being able asked to pay their taxes and that the tax burdens faced by every taxpayers are fair and transparent. Equally then, reciprocity, evidence that tax, pay tax payments are being used to provide concrete benefits to taxpayers within those jurisdictions. More ambitious is trying also to create spaces for taxpayers to engage with the administration. That could mean creating appeals processes that allow people to appeal their bills if they think they're inaccurate, and therefore building confidence in the system, creating help desks through which people can get information if they want it or need it in order to pay, and also potentially introducing forms of participatory budgeting or other mechanisms by which taxpayers can have an institutionalized voice in shaping how revenues are spent, thus making them more invested in the system and more willing to contribute to it. And here you can see some illustrations of what communications for governments in different places have looked like in trying to encourage compliance. Most of these are flyers illustrating how revenues are used and how to pay. In the bottom right, you can see an example of an initiative that used online tools to actually solicit public preferences around public spending in a simplified form of participatory budgeting to increase buy-in to reform efforts. Having tried to convince taxpayers to pay voluntarily, it's also important to have a clear system in place by which taxpayers can pay. The easier it is for taxpayers to pay, the more likely they are in practice to make those payments. But in many places, those systems haven't traditionally existed. One problem has been a reliance on in-person payments. That is either tax collectors going to properties and asking for money, or taxpayers needing to come to government offices to make payments. And taxpayers fear, and at least in some places there's evidence that they're right to fear this, that those revenues may not reach the government budget, but will inf instead be claimed by administrators themselves. It also creates space potentially for abuse and harassment of taxpayers during those interactions.
A more attractive alternative and one to which systems all over the world are moving is towards payments not being made to government officials or being made via online payments or mobile payments because that reduces the risk of corruption at the point of payment because the whole payment is automated. But there too, there are challenges because while it's easy to set up payments at banks, the key challenge for governments is also to ensure that when those payments are made, they're successfully and reliably matched to taxpayer accounts and registered to those taxpayers to ensure that their compliance is registered and they're not then subject to enforcement actions by government. If that matching process doesn't work, it's very difficult then for governments to identify who hasn't paid and pursue enforcement. The key challenge then for governments lies in introducing options for bank, online, or mobile payments, and systems that ensure that those payments are linked reliably, reliably to taxpayer accounts. In more rudimentary systems, one strategy for doing that has been to ask taxpayers to pay at banks, to have banks issue receipts to those taxpayers, and then ask taxpayers to bring those receipts to the tax office in order to register that a payment has been made. That's not bad as a second best option, but it does raise challenges. Taxpayers may not always bring those receipts to the government office, and that's gonna undermine record keeping and the potential for enforcement efforts down the line. It's also relatively high cost for taxpayers. As such, more recent efforts have tried to focus on how to create direct links from payments at banks or by mobile money or online into property tax IT systems so that payments can be registered automatically. That won't be possible everywhere, but is a system that's increasingly attractive to many governments trying to simplify the payments process and ensure that it's transparent and reliable. Finally, once payments have been made simple, once the government has tried to encourage people to pay their taxes, they also need strategies in place to pursue enforcement actions against taxpayers who don't pay all of their taxes by the payment deadline. Because few taxpayers will pay voluntarily in the absence of some threat of enforcement. Right? They need to know that there are potentially consequences to non-compliance. But we know in practice that across countries, enforcement of property taxes is often very, very weak. And it's often particularly weak among the very best off. And this is reflected in particular in very extensive property tax arrears. That is property taxpayers who are registered in the system, but year after year are not paying, but are also not su subject to government action to make them pay. And this often reflects a combination of the limits of administrative capacity to enforce and a political unwillingness to enforce. Sometimes that political unwillingness is only targeted at some taxpayers, who are allies of the government and are administrators and who are politically protected. In other cases, it's a more general political fear of pursuing enforcement action because of the risk of political backlash from taxpayers. And so the question for governments is, how can you build the political will to support meaningful and effective enforcement? And how in turn can you build an administrative process to carry that out effectively in the context often of limited capacity? One strategy that increasingly emerges from research is that governments may wish to focus on targeted, credible, and publicized enforcement, specifically among better off taxpayers. With that process backed by clear legal processes, strong appeals processes, and strategies to build broader political support for enforcement. The reason for targeting better off taxpayers is twofold. The first is they're the primary source of revenue for government, but it's also because many taxpayers worry that the best off aren't paying. And so targeted enforcement against those who are better off can send a strong signal to other taxpayers that enforcement is credible, and also that it's equitable and fair across the spectrum. Meanwhile, having a clear legal process and a strong appeals process signals to taxpayer that these processes are fair, that the government isn't taxing, targeting only certain taxpayers arbitrarily, but instead that there is a space to appeal if mistakes are being made or if taxpayers are being treated unfairly. 
All of these are strategies for building broader political support so that governments believe that they can pursue enforcement in the belief that taxpayers will actually embrace the importance of enforcement to ensure fairness and equity, rather than resisting enforcement based on the belief that it's arbitrary and unfair. The last thing I'll say is that undermining many of the reforms we've discussed so far is an effort to digitize property tax collection. That is to introduce IT systems, to improve data management, to improve administrative efficiency, to strengthen transparency, and to reduce the risks of collusion and corruption. And there are obviously enormous potentials associated with the introduction of new IT systems in a context in which many property tax systems have remained manually managed until recently. Yet despite the enormous potential of IT reform, we also know that IT reforms have often been relatively unsuccessful that is, they haven't delivered on their potential. While IT systems have been introduced, we often don't see the revenue increases, improvements in equity, improvements in transparency, and reduction in collusion that was expected when those systems were introduced. And it's useful to reflect on a few reasons why the introduction of new IT systems has often fallen short of expectations. Again, this isn't an exhaustive list, but it highlights some key considerations for governments. One is a simple problem of high costs relative to local resources. Local governments often have relatively limited revenues and they need IT systems that are relatively simple and affordable as a result. Yet often donor supported programs in particular might involve the introduction of relatively sophisticated but also costly IT systems that are difficult to maintain over time. That's closely related to a challenge of complexity. Complex systems can do more things, but they also might exceed the locally available capacity both to use those systems and to manage them over time, particularly in relatively low capacity environments, which often characterizes local administration. It's critical that systems be fit for purpose. That is, they do the essential things needed to improve administration, but without unnecessary, unnecessary complexity, which can undermine administration and increase costs. The third is a problem of weak sustainability. IT reform isn't just about introducing a system, it's also about being able to maintain that system over time when there are problems and update that system over time to reflect the changes in administrative processes and policy. To do that, there's often the need for support from the IT partner to engage in that updating process over time. And it's essential that governments have reliable and cost-effective IT support over the medium and long term. Yet what we see in some contexts is what's often referred to as technological lock-in. The IT provider who provides the system in the first place is also the only provider who can provide service and updates over time. And where that's the case, governments are extraordinarily vulnerable because whenever they need support, they have only one person to rely on often leading to delays or inadequate performance, but also leading to very high prices because governments lack options. Better is to design systems where the governments have the option of relying on the original provider or relying on other sources of support over time because those systems are open enough to other IT firms to make them manageable in the long term. A fourth concern is an often inattention to implementation barriers and change management. There are important reasons why administrators within tax administrations might be wary of the introduction of new IT systems. Some of them are technical. In context of limited IT skills, staff may fear that the introduction of IT systems will threaten their positions and their jobs, or that they won't be able to manage those new systems. It may also reflect a fear that the transparency brought by new IT systems might undermine their power and authority within these organizations or might reduce opportunities for collusion and corruption. Whatever the reason, reformers need clear strategies to bring people on board, to build skills, and to try to work against any resistance to reform that might arise. Underlying all of this is to simply the need to remember that IT systems are a tool, not a solution. IT systems are only as good as the data that goes into them and as the way that they're used by administrators themselves.
If processes aren't right, if the data is not right, if staff are not invested, IT systems will fail as well. And so IT systems are best understood as part of broader reform programs to ensure that the different steps of the property tax system are working effectively. The last thing to say as I wrap up is that it's important to remember that while there are relatively standard parts of the property tax cycle across countries, the particular solutions that governments might adopt in particular places are likely to vary. The right strategy for addressing particular parts of the property tax cycle will depend on local histories, local needs, local capacities, local institutions, and local politics. And it falls to individual countries and individual groups of administrators to try to understand the right strategies for their particular settings in order to advance improvements in outcomes. In this last part, uh, the presentation will focus on the steps and strategies to unlocking the property tax potential. And the three broad sets of factors need to be better understood, but also addressed when thinking about reform. Uh, first, the colonial legacy that set the path uh, for many of the current cha challenges related to effective property taxation needs to be understood. So one of the central pillars of colonization was tax. In fact, the European powers did not want Africa to be a drain of their treasuries, and they wanted the colonies to pay their own way while also wanting colonies to enter into a, uh, the cash economy. So taxation was a way of driving people into working for money. So more so, uh, this is a really good example, the competence of a French colonial official would be uh, measured by how much tax he was able to collect in the form of a poll tax or a tax on homes. So um, more, uh, most property tax systems in this case were inherited from colonial powers and they have posed deep technical administrative and political barriers to reform. Most systems rely uh, on professional values. Assigning an assessed market rental or sales value on the property, requiring that a tax be levied on an identifiable owner reflected in a formal cadastra, which somehow brings in formal formalization of the process when in some cases uh, this formalization was not existent. So from a technical uh, and practical point of view, this can be very labor and skills intensive, prone to abuse and errors, and also intransparent and difficult for taxpayers to understand. As a matter of fact, in the case of uh, market-based valuation, valuations that uh, aim to assess the value of a property uh, based on its market value, uh, many countries have been relying on manual valuation up to recently with the introduction of information technologies. And manual valuation will consist of valuing properties by moving from one house to another one in order to collect internal and external characteristics. And also uh, this requires that the owner of the property allows uh, access uh, to uh, the enumerators. So when this is done in large cities like, um, let's say Accra, Abidjan, or even Nairobi, uh, this can be a very daunting task, which also can be prone to uh, several uh, to errors for several re reasons, including the refusal of property uh, owners to give access to the properties, thus resulting in the enumerators writing subjective, uh, let's say, characteristics of that property. So in the lack of a clear uh, property market system, property values can then be uh, assessed subjectively. And from a political point of view, uh, property taxation relies on complex intergovernmental coordination that has cre uh, created perverse administrative incentives, but also connects property taxation to broader uh, conflicts over land. Uh, such involvement in, um, so, so such kind of collaboration or uh, uh, collaboration, yes, between central government and local governments require um, more coordinated actions, which in many cases are uh, lacking. 
So meanwhile, uh, property taxes are often associated with legacies of uh, coercive colonial taxation and abuse. And a good example illustrating this is the hut tax war in Sierra Leone, or even the window tax uh, in Ghana in the colonial area. Era. So in Sierra Leone, the imposition of a tax on individual property in the 1890s was the kind of final straw uh, for, for uh, Temne and uh, Mende chiefs, two, two uh, main traditional chiefs, who had seen a big increase in um, British intervention in the colony, including uh, stamping out slavery, seizing any land without title uh, deeds, or appointing district commissioners. So this lead uh, to uh, the hard tax war, this all, which was violent and res res resulted in the death of some uh, British officials, as well as anyone who was suspecting, uh, suspected of collaborating. In the case of Ghana, also in the 1860s, so the British uh, tried to introduce a local tax on immovable properties, which was based on a num uh, the number of windows in a building. And these uh, efforts also encountered consistent challenges in um, administrative challenges, but also jurisdictional disputes. Uh, from an, an administrative point of view, uh, property taxes can be uh, complex to uh, administer. Uh, some activities uh, like expert uh, property evaluation or even uh, the use or introduction of new IT systems can be technically uh, co complex with effective property taxation require, uh, requiring well-coordinated administrative actions. And as explained earlier, uh, valuation, for instance, which is labor and skill, uh, skills intensive, can be a very complex task for governments, especially when they don't have the adequate capacity to handle this uh, process. And more recently, uh, the introduction of uh, information technology systems has even added another layer to this complexity. In many cases, uh, we see that these systems are not easy to use or they may not be tailored to the need or needs of tax authorities. So also the whole property tax process from property identification to collection enforcement requires uh, collaboration and coordinated actions among the different parties involved. And uh, one way probably to illustrate how this coordination is uh, present in all the systems is that for instance, in French uh, or Francophone countries, property taxation is a central government responsibilities, but this relies on coordination and collaboration among the different agencies in charge of the different uh, aspects of the property tax cycle, including those agencies in, in charge of issuing that land titles, which then allows for uh, property identification, agencies in charge of evaluation and those in charge of taxation. So these agencies will work on the different as aspects of the property tax uh, cycle. And in order to have an effective process, it will require collaboration. In Anglophone countries, this is also the same, where property taxes is often a local government responsibility, mainly in terms of collecting the tax, but other responsibilities uh, can be assigned to the central government, such as uh, setting the, the tax rate or uh, uh, property identification or valuation, or even the approval of property roles when they are done by uh, local governments. And often uh, uh, collaboration or coordination is lacking. And one of uh, the major consequences of that is uh, probably uh, limited information flow, as well as poor data sharing between the different departments or the different government agencies. From an institutional point of view, uh, this complexity can be obvious because uh, system often assign responsibility to multiple institutions, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, also at different levels with ambiguity around key roles and authorities. For instance, uh, who will be in charge of land cadastre, uh, in charge of valuation or uh, taxation? These different authorities may have these responsibilities, though it's not often clear in the legislation how they should undertake those responsibilities. So this creates what can be called an institutional fragmentation resulting in um, from the, this assignment of different responsibilities. And it also leads to uh, sometimes overlapping mandates and ultimately ineffectiveness uh, in the whole process.
So the same can also apply to data sharing, uh, let's say at the same level in a local government between evaluation department and the revenue collection department, which in theory should be straightforward, but in practice also becomes complex. And this complexity is also um, exacerbated by the fact that uh, many uh, local authorities or local governments lack uh, an, uh, an integrated information sharing system that can allow uh, an easy flow of information. Finally, uh, these administrative challenges create scope for informality and abuse. So property taxation offers a wide scope for collusion and corruption at many stages. Example, keeping properties off the tax register when local governments lack the capacity to identify uh, properties more effectively. And evaluation can also be uh, one of uh, the challenges, but also uh, when collection is done manually and revenues paid in cash or requiring interaction between revenue collectors and taxpayers. When this is done in a case of uh, a local government that doesn't have a transparent system that allows the tracking of the movement of money, but also a good reporting system, all this leads to more informality and abuse in the system. So uh, finally, in thinking about reform, it is important to pay attention to the uh, varieties uh, of political challenges. And in this case, we can list three. So the first one is the resistance from taxpayers. Uh, research evidence shows that uh, there is a severe under uh, taxation of large properties with large property owners often exercising political and economic influence. Uh, property owners, who let's say had, had not had to pay taxes before the reform may use the political connection to resist taxation when they are targeted during reform as they are uh, added to the tax net. Uh, the second form of resistance often comes from uh, administrators as well as their networks. Uh, as existing systems offer uh, expensive scope for informal um, collusion and extraction, and administrators may also resist reform because they may threaten their uh, opportunities as well as uh, their interests. So this is mainly when uh, the reform brings more transparent systems that allow more effective tracking of, let's say, taxpayers' information or data, as well as revenue collection. And a third form of resistance can come from national governments as well as political parties. Uh, particularly in uh, decentralized systems, stronger property taxation can strengthen uh, subnational autonomy as if governments uh, are able to raise more revenues, they can uh, increase the uh, fiscal autonomy. And strong fiscal autonomy can pose a threat to national authorities or even political parties while central governments uh, retain wide scope to block uh, reform efforts. Uh, in several cases uh, in many countries, local authorities have been ineffective in undertaking reform due to uh, central government interference, but also because uh, central governments have had weak incentives to support reform, considering that the ultimate benefits or outcomes of these reforms are revenue collection, which will go to local governments. So the revenue does not accrue to them, which creates weak incentives for them to support reform. In uh, another situation, when we think about political parties, they can also uh, resist uh, reform to preserve their pol uh, political interests. So for instance, during elections, politicians have used tax exemptions and waivers as a mean of, uh, let's say, garnering more uh, votes and reform aiming at including potential voters who are used to these waivers into the tax net can also be resisted politically. Ultimately, the central question facing reformers is whether property tax reform can be better aligned to the capacity, administrative and political constraints of lower income countries. Put differently, it's to understand why current reform efforts have often underperformed and whether there are alternative models of reform and strategies for pursuing reform, could, which could be more successful 
given the particular characteristics of particular political, institutional, and administrative contexts. There's obviously no single answer to the question of how to design successful reform and how to implement successful reform across countries. Diverse contexts will require diverse solutions. But we can say a few things about the key characteristics of successful reform. And I would highlight three things that are likely to be central aspects of the design of any successful reform program. The first is trying to arrive at contextually appropriate reform strategies in the technical design of reform. The second is having clear strategies to build political commitment to reform in order to overcome potential resistance. And the third is to try to strengthen taxpayer support and tax compliance specifically. When we talk about the importance of contextually appropriate reform strategies, the core message is that reform strategies and the technical design of systems should reflect local capacities as well as local political constraints and opportunities. That is, reform strategies need to be fit for purpose and fit to context. In general, recent research suggests that effective property tax reform in lower income context in particular is likely to have at least four key characteristics. First is systems design that reduces capacity needs relative to the often highly demanding design of systems that have been in place historically. The second is trying to limit data needs. We know that data about property markets is relatively limited in many low-income countries because property markets are opaque and market data is relatively inaccessible. So we need strategies that acknowledge the limitations of data and then build systems accordingly. Third is a focus on increasing transparency. There's no way around the fact that it is a significant drag on the performance of property tax systems across countries has been first, risks of collusion and corruption involving tax administrators and taxpayers. And secondly, is a lack of trust among taxpayers that tax systems are fair and equitable, which has undermined compliance. Through increased transparency, it can be possible to increase trust in tax systems while reducing opportunities for corruption and collusion. Finally, there's a central need to think about the design of reform strategies and the design of technical systems to manage property taxation that can also increase equity and political acceptability. The political acceptability of property tax reform depends critically on perceptions of whether systems are fair, that is, everyone pays their fair share, whether they're equitable in the way they distribute tax burdens between those who are better off and those who are less well off. Some technical solutions will make those things clear. Others will call them into question. There's an increasing understanding that because property tax reform is fundamentally a political challenge, we need technical strategies and solutions that are likely to reinforce trust and political acceptability. And so ultimately, technical appropriateness isn't simply a question about what technical design is most closely aligned to the most sophisticated systems in the world, or what technical design maximizes the theoretical accuracy and quality of outcomes. What's important is arriving at technically appropriate solutions that increase administrability in practice within the context of often limited capacity and which also create the potential to build buy-in from taxpayers and respond to and overcome political resistance to reform. Some of the strategies we discussed so far fit that description. Beyond a focus on technically appropriate solutions, any successful reform program needs to think hard about the political prerequisites of successful reform. Because property tax reform inevitably confronts powerful opponents. Right? Large property owners who will face the largest property tax bills are also often well connected to political leaders and administrative leaders. It's only with committed political leadership that those powerful opponents are likely to be overcome. We might then want to think about when and why 
such politically committed leadership emerges? And part of the answer is, we simply don't know. There's no perfect way of predicting when good leadership will emerge. Part of the challenge here is to be able to mobilize well-conceptualized reform efforts when that leadership arises, whenever and why ever it does arise. That said, we can also think about some factors that may shape the emergence of effective and committed political leadership. One central message from research is that while property tax often is unpopular politically, property tax reform when done well should and indeed can be broadly politically popular because this is all about raising more revenue, particularly from the best off within society in order to fund public services. And there's the potential to show those services quite explicitly within a local government context. And where governments have introduced reforms that are simple, that are transparent, and that yield benefits, we actually see that those systems are quite popular. The challenge then is to get those first steps to happen successfully in order to build that broader popular support. Beyond that, we can say a few things about political circumstances that seem often to contribute to giving rise to political commitment and leadership. One thing we see is that where systems are decentralized in particular, subnational governments may pursue reform in order to expand their fiscal autonomy from central governments. And so we often see reform efforts emerging actually among opposition political parties because they're seeking greater fiscal autonomy from central governments who are controlled by the other political party. We've also seen across countries sometimes that subnational competition and imitation may drive enthusiasm for reform. If reform begins to happen in one city or one region of a, of a country, it's often then possible to publicize those successes to other cities and regions in order to, on one hand, demonstrate the potential for success, but on the other hand, also create pressure on those places to replicate the success of their neighbors. Finally, we know that support of central governments can play a critical role in facilitating supporting reform across different districts when central governments are motivated to do so. And there's a real complementarity between central and local initiatives in the best case scenario. Finally, we might ask ourselves, how can you know that political leadership exists? How can you know that there's enough political leadership in place to overcome that inevitable resistance? And one message from research is to look for evidence of politically challenging but technically low cost action taken by political leaders, because that's often where we can see commitment in practice. Right? It's easy for a political leader to say they're committed to reform. It's when they take those politically challenging steps that the reform becomes clear. So, for example, what often a key barrier to effective taxation is weak data sharing within government and weak data transparency. Leaders who push for data transparency, that's often a strong signal of commitment. We know that across countries, the collection of tax arrears is often very reluctant. There's this unwillingness to take the political step of pursuing those who have not complied. Where political leaders begin to pursue enforcement broadly, including among politically influential individuals, that's a signal of commitment. More broadly, where we see an expansion of transparency and broader outreach and transparency towards taxpayers, that often across context seems to be a signal of deeper political commitment to reform. While we often think about the need for political support from political leaders, often overlooked is the essential importance of also having political support from administrators themselves. And that's in part true because administrators who are committed to reform can really drive reform forward, even where political commitment is somewhat limited. But it's equally because a growing number of case studies have revealed the ways in which administrators are often resistant to reform and can therefore pose a critical threat to successful reform. And that resistance to reform among administrators reflects a number of things, of which I'd highlight three. One is that administrators might think the reform is a threat to their positions, where reform involves, for example, greater reliance on technology or reduced reliance on expert valuers. Groups that have the that lack IT skills or groups of professional valuers may be resistant to reform because they feel under threat. The second is a fear 
that reform might pose a threat to their power. That is, they might enjoy significant administrative discretion. They may exercise almost unlimited power within their institutional spaces. They may have control over particular data. They may, by virtue of that power, be able to distribute benefits to their allies and friends. Right? Reform may pose a risk to those things by making systems more transparent, more inclusive, and less limited in who access, has access to information. And finally, administrators may view reform as a threat to their incomes. If they're engaging in collusion or corruption, and the reform is likely to limit space for those opportunities in the future. And so reformist governments need to have strategies for gaining buy-in from administrators and trying to address some of those fears. Unfortunately, we don't really know that much from a research perspective about how to do that. Often it's individual actors in country who are gonna have insights into the nature of these administrative dynamics, where the risks are and strategies to overcome them. That said, a few messages are already out there from experience and research. One is the obvious importance of supporting training, engaging in careful change management, building local buy-in among administrators to reduce the sense that their positions are threatened by reform, but instead reinforce the message that existing administrators can own this new system, which will make their work better and easier over time. A second possibility is looking at the possibility of improved pay or performance contracts for staff who engage successfully in reform. If reform poses a threat to informal incomes through collusion or corruption, increasing salaries for those who perform well under the new system might be a way of mitigating those fears, though any such strategies need to be implemented carefully. A third could be trying to really gain buy-in from senior management, who in turn can then gain buy-in from the rank and file within the public administration. But again, this is an area where there's much more to learn. The key message for now is that this should be a central focus of strategies for reform across countries. A third area of politics, when we think about the politics of reform, is the need to also consider intergovernmental politics. Property tax administration requires close coordination between central and subnational governments, although in diverse combinations that look very different in different countries. As a result, it becomes really critical that there be strategies in place to ensure that central government and local government are working well together, and in particular that central governments are not undermining the potential for subnational reform. The areas of overlapping responsibility between central and subnational governments are many, though again varied. There's often overlap in responsibility for land registration. Land and property ownership registration may be a national concern, whereas property tax registers may be a local concern. There's often overlapping responsibility around valuation, where you may see that valuation is controlled by central government, even if other aspects of property tax administration are controlled locally. There's often some overlap in rate setting, with central governments setting broad rules around rate setting and local governments having a measure of autonomy in then tweaking the way their rates locally. There are often broader administrative guidelines from central governments that shape local practices and possibilities. In some cases, local administration is appointed by or reports to the central government, thus creating mixed loyalties and the need for alignment in motivating administrators to invest in reform. IT systems inevitably need to be able to bridge between the needs of central reporting and local operation. And there can be spaces for collaboration where central governments support local IT systems, but also the risk that central government resistance can prevent moving forward on needed local digitalization. Given all of these those areas of overlap, there is a risk of governments or tax administrations being thwarted by resistance by other agencies critical to advancing reform. So you may, for example, have property tax authorities who are committed to reform, but they face resistance from a separate valuation office, or they face resistance from a separate land registration office. And so again, making sure that that cooperation works and identifying where the need for cooperation is most acute becomes a critical aspect of reform planning across countries.
Finally, undermining all of this is a central question for many reformers. If you're interested in supporting reform in a particular country, should you begin by promoting reform in an individual subnational location, which may be smaller and more tractable to get reform off the ground? Or should you start at the central level, given that central cooperation is often critical to reform, and that if the central government gets invested, they can then support reform across a wider range of areas? Across countries, we see examples of success in both cases, though some of the most interesting case studies are of interesting experiments and pilot projects and reforms in individual localities, which are then scaled up nationally after they've been successful. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle when we think about successful reform is strengthening taxpayer compliance and support for reform. Taxpayers are the most obvious source of resistance to reform because they simply don't want to be taxed and certainly don't want to be taxed if they don't think systems are fair and equitable and bring them benefits in return. But on the other hand, taxpayers can also be critical allies in overcoming resistance from vested interests. If in existing property tax systems are inequitable, they're incomplete, they're not raising enough revenue, there's the potential to mobilize the broad base of property taxpayers around a set of messages that emphasize the desire to build a fairer and more equitable system that will better finance needed services nationally or locally. And so the key question then is, in a particular location, do taxpayers in fact believe that systems are fair and that they will generate benefits to them? If they believe that systems are, there can be significant political support for reform. But where they don't believe that, the politics of reform can become intractable and compliance with tax rules is likely to be undermined. That makes efforts by governments to build that trust among taxpayers absolutely critical to any successful reform. And we've highlighted in these presentations a series of aspects of how they might do that. For example, by bringing into place fairer valuation or more universal identification of properties, putting in place effective appeals processes that give reassurance to taxpayers that they're being treated fairly, ensuring enforcement among the rich or the relatively powerful to convince taxpayers that the system is genuinely fair for everyone under the law, or investing in reciprocal service delivery and making that new service delivery visible to taxpayers or even giving them a voice through participatory processes and shaping what that service delivery looks like so that they can concretely see the benefits that are flowing from successful property tax reform. Because it's when that's true that many of the other things we've discussed here become possible.